Welcome to yet another video on uh, from MA3D1. This video is on flow around an airfoil. This is section 6.6. .6. I think in the notes. This is the last topic in potential flow and therefore the recap for this topic is all of potential flow. And in the interest of time, I won't go into the recap. You should, at this point, be familiar with all the topics of potential flow because we are going to use all of them, right? And we are going to introduce some new ones. So in this uh, video, we are going to consider the flow around an airfoil, which, you know, consider a wing of this shape it's uh, immersed in a free stream flow and gives rise to streamlines that look like that right. so this is the airfoil it is a really slender shape streamlined and it is used to generate lift. Now lift is a force. If this is the direction of the free stream, then lift is a force that is perpendicular to the free stream or the uniform flow far away, which I'm calling the free stream. Okay. Now, uh, it so happens that we can derive, almost derive a closed form expression for the force of uh, for the lift on an airfoil we'll be using the kutta uh, theorem but to actually have some confidence that this indeed does give us the correct flow and the correct lift i am going to compare the results with what i computed using a commercial software called Comsol. This is a finite element software. You can use it to solve for all sorts of flows and other multi-physics problems. But in this situation, the Comsol comes with its own example of flow around an airfoil. So here is an airfoil which is I think two meters long and it is 20 centimeters thick. It has this sort of streamlined shape. It is symmetric top down, but it is uh, immersed in a flow that comes at an angle, right? That's why the streamlines are all at an angle. The angle is quite, not quite this steep as I have drawn, but you will notice that uh, this is uh, 10 centimeters on the Y axis and for about the same distance, Yeah, right. This is one meter. It's not a one is to one uh, plotting on the two axes. And therefore, the aspect ratio is distorted. Right. So having said that, let's look at some of the important features of the flow around this, around, uh, this airfoil shape. You can clearly see that the streamlines all go around the airfoil. Right. Oh, by the way, I must point out, that in so Comsol solves the Navier Stokes equations, the viscous Navier Stokes equations. It does not solve for potential flow necessarily. <clears throat> so it computed the solution to the viscous flow problem. It took a small value of viscosity, not setting it to zero, and this is the flow that it computed, and this is what we want to represent and understand as much as possible. And here is our first attempt to do it at least qualitatively. You see the streamlines all go around the body. They obviously satisfy the no penetration condition. In this case, they also satisfy the no slip condition, but we don't have any indication of it in this figure, in this streamline pattern. Okay. But there is a stagnation streamline. We have seen what a stagnation streamline is. A stagnation streamline is one that terminates on the body at a stagnation point. 
Well, in this case, there is a true stagnation point all around the airfoil because the no slip condition is satisfied. But that, if you start with a stream function that has that value on the surface of the airfoil and plot the contour for constant stream function, then we get the black streamline. And you see, this looks just like flow around an immersed body now. There are all these other streamlines also and we are going to make use of the fact and try and understand the consequence of it. So now we expect potential flow to represent this type of flow faithfully and on top of that, at least near the air file, and on top of that, what we also expect is that it will give us the lift force on the airfoil and it will give us a physical intuition for what generates the lift. Okay, and let me start with the intuition first. This on the stagnation streamline, at the stagnation point, we have stagnation pressure. If you did example sheet, I think it was six or seven or six, I think something like that. On Bernoulli equation, on applications of Bernoulli equation, you remember that, or you can just look at the solutions, that at this stagnation point in potential flow, you would have, or in inviscid flow, you would have uh, a excess pressure of one half rho u squared relative to the uh, ambient atmospheric pressure. So there is higher pressure just near the leading edge of the wing, right underneath it. And what I'm also going to argue is that on top of it, there is going to be a, a small region of low pressure. The reason for that is look at the way the streamlines are curved. A fluid particle will now follow these streamlines and go around this curved path. That means something has to provide the acceleration to go along this curved path. And that acceleration, there is no other agency in inviscid flow other than the, the fluid pressure. So uh, the acceleration is towards the center of the streamlines. So the pressure has to decrease towards the center of the streamline. So by the time you get to, you start with atmospheric pressure far away, and by the time you get to the surface of the airfoil, above the airfoil close to the leading edge, you get a region of very low pressure right there. So we have high pressure underneath and very low pressure above. And it is really this difference in pressure right near the leading edge that is responsible for a large fraction of the lift that the airfoil generates. And it's visible all, it's all visible here in this streamline pattern. But another thing to pay attention to is the streamlines near the trailing edge, you will see, there's a, the trailing edge of this wing has a sharp point as like a corner. And the streamline, the stagnation streamli streamline, separates from the shape of the body exactly at that point. Okay. This is another observation to keep in mind. So with a, with a situation, with a solution like this, what one can also do is actually compute the force exerted by the fluid on the airfoil. You would get a non-zero drag because we are solving for viscous flow, so the D'Alembert paradox does not apply. And we'll get a non-zero lift depending on the angle of attack. But if the angle of attack was zero, the angle of attack is the angle made by the airfoil to the oncoming flow. Here we have kept the airfoil horizontal but have the flow come in at an angle and that's, that would be the angle of attack. If the flow was also horizontal aligned with the shape of the wing, then there would be no lift because of symmetry. But with angle of attack, we start, we'll start to get more and more lift. And such a solution would allow you to numerically compute the lift as a function of angle of attack. And that is something that we should keep in the back of our mind. In the event that we find a simple expression for the lift, we might use that to compare with the more complicated computational solution of Navier-Stokes around this airfoil shape. All right. So let's 
go back to the writing surface and see what we can do. So our strategy for finding the flow around an airfoil is going to simplify, our approach will be to simplify the shape of the airfoil. So we are going to simplify the shape of the airfoil to a flat plate. And just like we did in console, we are going to have the flow come in at an angle. To the flat plate. This flat plate is our model for a wing. After all, you can take a piece of cardboard and move it at an angle relative to its face and you can experience the lift that it generates. And this is the sort of situation we want to, uh, the, this is what we believe would be the simplest model to represent uh, the flow around a wing. Now we would also want to get streamlines and whatnot by solving for potential. Though there's only one problem. We have to figure out the potential, the complex potential that would satisfy the no penetration condition on this flat plate. Um, how would one go about doing that? So in order to address this mathematical difficulty, there is a technique in complex variables called conformal mapping which says the following you want your complex potential in the z plane but you don't know what the complex potential is in the z plane so what you do is you construct a map, which I will do in red. This is called a conformal map, which says, what does it say? Let me now refer to my notes for the sake of. Z is a function of zeta such that in the zeta plane, which I'm about to draw now, zeta is C plus I eta. In the zeta plane, this map, uh, what it does, it takes a circle in the zeta plane It takes a circle in the zeta plane and maps it to a flat plate in the z plane. If a continuous map like this is, uh, is found, a differentiable, if an analytic map f of zeta is found, then what we can do is we can have the, poten the potential flow, the complex, complex potential for flow around a circle in the zeta plane and use the map to construct the potential flow around a flat plate. Okay, this is the basic idea. Let's see if such a map, if uh, such a map can be found. So now I'll switch to red. And my claim is f of zeta is what's the one plus epsilon zeta plus one minus epsilon a squared over zeta that this map serves our purpose epsilon and a are constants a and we are going to figure out what these constants are supposed to be okay. uh, Right. So if we substitute a circle a e to the i theta for some theta, 
in the zeta plane which means that's what we substitute for zeta that gives f of zeta is 1 plus epsilon a e to the i theta plus 1 minus epsilon a e to the minus i theta when factor of a cancels the e to the i theta in the denominator becomes e to the minus i theta in the numerator if i take all the terms uh, that do not depend on epsilon I get a to the i theta plus a e to the minus i theta which is 2a cosine theta and if I take all the terms that are proportional to epsilon then I get plus 2i a epsilon sine theta and if you stare at this expression long enough you will notice that here f of zeta which is z is an ellipse with major axis 2a along the x axis and minor axis 2a epsilon along the y axis. So we didn't quite map the circle to a flat plate we mapped it to an ellipse so let me draw this ellipse now the ellipse looks like this fair enough except we can choose to take the limit as epsilon goes to zero and then we do get the flat plate limit <coughs> so that is going to be our conformal map on the other side, I want to do flow around a, a circle. But the flow has to be at an angle. And if I choose the angle to be alpha, then I think I can write down the potential. But in this case, the potential will be a function of the variable zeta, which will be u times zeta e to the minus i alpha plus a squared over zeta e to the i alpha really I, what i should write is zeta e to the minus i alpha wherever a, a zeta appears zeta e to the minus i alpha because what it just says is let's rotate the whole plane by an angle minus alpha so that the flow will appear to come from an angle plus alpha actually let me just verify that is correct seems to be correct this is what i have in the notes so this is the complex potential in the zeta plane now we construct the conformal map step now we construct the map w of z this is our complex potential in the z plane it's nothing but little w of f inverse of z the f inverse of z takes any point in the z plane and finds its corresponding point in the zeta plane by the way you can convince yourself without too much trouble that as long as epsilon is positive it's a uh, inject sorry it's a bijection hang on yes it's a bijection for just the region outside the circle in the zeta plane to the z plane with the points on the surface of that circle going to the flat plate and because it's a bijection now we can find a unique inverse and then the value of the potential you assign to any point depends on the map you find the corresponding point in the zeta plane and find the potential for that point according to flow around the circle and that's it now what you have con con uh, what you have constructed is an analytic 
potential complex potential right because the imaginary part of this potential on the surface of the circle on the surface of the circle will be the stream function for flow around the circle and we know that the stream function is a constant along uh, along the circle so the stream function will also be a constant along the plate and voila we would have the flat plate automatically becoming a streamline so the trick though the mathematical trick is to avoid writing this inverse because you can imagine this gives you a quadratic equation for zeta as a function of z. You solve it, you get all sorts of nasty expressions. So as much as possible, let's not worry about actually inverting the map in practice. Let's just be satisfied in the knowledge that an inverse can be found and then work as much as possible without writing the inverse. Without that's right, without writing the inverse. Okay. So the next step that we need is to find the speed of the fluid in uh, the Z plane. We are going to relate the speed, the Z plane to the speed in the zeta plane in the following way. The speed in the Z plane U minus IV is DW DZ. Right, D w, capital W D Z. Now, in order to distinguish my little W's from capital W's, I'm going to decorate my capital W's, and that d this derivative can be written as D W D zeta divided by D Z D zeta. You see, I can now use the fact that I have Z as a function of zeta, not necessarily the inverse to write this expression. And this expression is really easy to construct now because W as a function of zeta has a simple form u e to the minus i alpha minus a squared over zeta squared to the minus i alpha divided by dz d zeta. Here is z as a function of z here is z as a function of zeta. And I'm now going to substitute epsilon tiny. So it works to substitute epsilon equals zero. Uh, I won't uh, show you all the details, but I just know and you can verify without too much trouble. So I consider epsilon to be zero. And d z d zeta is then one minus a squared over zeta squared. And that is our velocity. Now we have the velocity in the in the Z plane. There is one problem though. Okay. And I will I will have to fix that problem right away. So I have left some space here and I recommend that you leave some space there too. And corresponding to that I will also need some space after this expression. And in order to appreciate that Let's look at the streamline pattern you get from this potential, which is not too complicated to evaluate, right? I have given you the recipe. Now, the way we uh, visualized all the other flows, we can do the same sort of, we can modify those methods trivially in order to visualize this flow. So let's see what we get. Uh, flat plate one. And here we go. So the top panel shows the flow in the zeta plane. You see the x-axis is C, the y-axis is eta. You have a nice circle. You have flow at an angle. So this is uh, flow around your cylinder at an angle of attack, but that was just a trivial modification to the potential. And after the map is done, the circle flattens to this flat plate here. This is in the Z plane. You can see the axes are X and Y. So this is in the Z plane. So this streamline, this stagnation streamline is that one here. This point on the circle maps to that point there. 
and also that point maps to that pointer. So you see the stagnation streamline attaches to the shape of the body, to the flat plate over there, and you see how the flow goes around the flat plate, etc. Right. Now this looks okay. It looks like a flow, except it violates one observation, and there is really a very good reason for adhering to that observation and that is if I had plotted if I had plotted another streamline in between here what it would need to have done is go around like that and then turn around the trailing edge of the body turn around like that turn around, go around the body, turn around and then go. Uh, it cannot, streamlines cannot cross. So it has to remain between those two streamlines. And what happens as a consequence is that because as you get closer and closer to the trailing edge of this flat plate, you get to streamlines that have to turn around infinitely sharply. Because after all, we are saying that the flat plate is a streamline and there is slip allowed in this solution. So if the slip is allowed, you have the streamlines going under the flat plate and then as soon as they reach the trailing edge, they have to turn around immediately. And that is a problem for streamlines. This also happens at the leading edge to an extent. This, uh, no, this in fact happens at the leading edge also. Now fluids have inertia and there is also viscosity which this potential flow solution sort of shrugs under the carpet. The effect of both the inertia and the viscosity is that the fluid does not want to follow this sharp turn. The fluid instead wants to keep on flowing straight because of its inertia. Right. And the viscosity allows it to do that, no matter how small the viscosity is. That's the effect that viscosity has. And I'm just going to tell you this in words for now. With experience, you will see why this is in fact true. And you're not supposed to infer this for in an exam. So this is just a matter of practice, which, you know, is my job to communicate to you. So because of that, there is a condition, which I'll write down, that states that streamlines cannot go around sharp corners like that. Streamlines should not be allowed to go around sharp corners like that. This streamline, this stagnation streamline should not be there. It should actually be on the trailing edge so that the streamline separates nicely. I'll show you in another panel. And this is in fact what we saw, the solution of the Navier-Stokes equation, which we computed using ComSol. That's what it did. The solution, the, the, the streamline, the trailing streamline did not separate on top of the airfoil. It separated from the trailing edge of the airfoil. This was, this is going to be important, right? This, this is the observation. And the, uh, incident stagnation streamline it attaches to the bottom of the body and then there is a streamline that will go around the leading edge of the flat plate infinitely rapidly but what the effect of viscosity is is to smooth that out but viscosity cannot smooth out this singularity at the trailing edge and that leads to a small modification that we must make to our potential flow to account for the behavior of real fluids. Okay, so here we go. What we have to do is remember the most general potential flow can have a point vortex. We have to add a point vortex i gamma over 2 pi log z yeah, that's perfect 
and because of this you get i gamma over 2 pi z now what this point vertex does if you can choose the strength of the point vertex just right it gives rise to a flow that looks a li it looks like this the point vertex causes a flow in the clockwise direction firstly okay now with the clockwise flow the stagnation point which was there is now moved to down here okay and we move we choose the strength of the point vortex just enough such that the stagnation point is purely on the real axis because that's the point that is mapped to the trailing edge of the plate so now you see the modified streamline pattern in the xy plane has a stagnation streamline separating exactly from the trailing edge and now the incident streamline is incident on the bottom of the plate this is a little exaggerated for easy visualization it doesn't quite attach so far behind the uh, leading edge but it is exaggerated and there are streamlines that go infinitely rapidly around the leading edge okay that turn around infinitely rapidly around the leading edge and this is the flow situation we want to establish so how do we do that and analytically so you see the way it works analytically is that the trailing edge corresponds to zeta equals a it's on the real axis on mm -hmm. uh, the positive half of the real axis and at zeta equals a you look at the denominator here and the denominator blows up and that's the singularity that i was talking about the fluid velocity blows up but it's more insidious than that like i mentioned it's not simply that the velocity blows up the velocity also blows up as you can see here but perhaps the no slip boundary condition could have regularized that what is more insidious and what's hard to see in this expression but i've shown you in the streamline pattern so not only does the velocity blow up but this velocity which is approaching infinity turns around on itself around the trailing edge it that is a little hard to see from this expression but it like i showed you in the visual it does happen and what we want to ensure is that there is no singularity insist on no singularity there insist no singularity so the way you insist is you find you evaluate the numerator at z equals a numerator and the numerator is just the velocity in the zeta plane right which means this is the flow around the circle so you find the flow around the circle on the real axis on z equals a on zeta equals a and you find u e to the minus i alpha plus a square e to the i alpha divided by a square so that cancels the a square minus i gamma over 2 pi a equals 0 so the necessary condition is that the numerator must also vanish and we should verify after that that after the numerator is made to vanish this expression becomes regular at zeta equals a and this implies that gamma is i think minus 4 pi a u or something like that minus 4 pi a u sine alpha you do a little bit of you, you can already see that this is minus 2 u i sine alpha right this was a negative 
So if you take things on the other side and rearrange a bit, you see an expression like this arising, which is what, which is what it does. So if we choose the strength of the point vortex judiciously in this manner, then we can uh, at least satisfy the necessary condition for no singularity. This condition is called the Kutta condition. You impose the Kutta condition, this is the outcome. And finally, mm, am I going to verify that there is no singularity after imposing this condition? Uh, I don't think so. Yes. Uh, I, I, I have already verified that there is no singularity after imposing this condition because I showed you this streamline pattern. You can see the streamlines are all nice and smooth there. There is no scope for the velocity to blow up anymore. Uh, even if the denominator of the expression vanishes, the numerator also vanishes and it vanishes in such a way that the flow remains regular. Uh, in fact, it was, a, it was a question in the exam last year to figure out the finite magnitude of velocity at the trailing edge. So I'll refer you to the solutions from last year, which I will post shortly. So with that done, now we have the flow around a flat plate. It is given by the potential, excuse me, given by the potential, uh, Composite form is expressed in terms of these two functions w of zeta and f of zeta in this composition and now it is left for us to find the force on the flat plate we know that it's a force of lift and it will be equal to rho u gamma and we have calculated gamma here, which is rho u, the negatives cancel, and gamma is 4 pi a u sine alpha. This is in the y direction. So we get rho u squared a 4 pi sine alpha. In fact, I'm not go just going to use a, I'm going to use what am I going to use? 2a, 4a. And I am a little confused, so let me just. Yes, perfect. And here you will see uh, that this is the lift on a flat plate the flow around an airfoil does differ from the flow around a flat plate but it does share so many similarities and because of that it's worth comparing the lift that you get on an airfoil with the lift that you get on a flat plate now the way this lift is characterized is in dimensionless form you form the coefficient of lift it's given the symbol cl is fy divided by one half rho u squared times 4a why 4a because 4a is the length of the flat plate it is 2a on this side and it is 2a on this side and that gives you the that gives us the 4a so uh, 4a is this term is the 4a the length of the airfoil is called is termed the chord of the airfoil for whatever reason 
uh, that's the terminology that is used. So now if I substitute the Fy here in this expression, then what I'm left with is a 2 pi sine alpha. Right? So the lift coefficient as a function of alpha has this behavior. Uh, that's our prediction for it. And now I am going to show you what we get from um, the COMSOL simulation. Ta-da! Let me zoom in a bit. On the x-axis is alpha in degrees. On the y-axis is the lift coefficient calculated from this humongously complicated uh, computation by COMSOL. Each of the blue dots is one angle of attack that was calculated by COMSOL. It takes a few minutes to do this in COMSOL, but you can imagine all the development that went into COMSOL also. On the y-axis is the lift coefficient. So, and the black line here is our expression 2 pi sine alpha. So if alpha was plotted in radians, then the slope of this line would be 2 pi. And no matter what airfoil shape you choose, the slope of the lift coefficient versus alpha in radians is approximately 2 pi, which is the remarkable success, which indicates the remarkable success of potential flow theory in explaining lift on an airfoil shaped wing. Uh, this is really the the crown in the jewel of potential the jewel in the crown of the of potential flow theory uh, that it is able to um, predict the lift on an airfoil so well. At the same time there is a giant pitfall in potential flow theory because it does not predict any drag on the flow on the uh, immersed body. There is no drag because then that's D'Alembert paradox. So in order to resolve this, we have to rectify one basic assumption of potential flow theory that the flow can be written as the gradient of a potential. But a necessary and sufficient condition for that is that the vorticity in the flow, the curl of velocity, vanish everywhere in the flow. And it so happens that the uh, that vorticity does not vanish anywhere, everywhere in the flow as we had originally imagined. There were very good reasons to <coughs> assume that vorticity does vanish everywhere in the flow. But those reasons turn out to be too good to be true. And uh, what we near, really need to understand next is why is the flow not a potential flow everywhere in the flow? The flow is potential in a large region of the fluid, which is also true in the case of an airfoil, flow around an airfoil. It's potential flow almost everywhere, but not quite everywhere. And it is this understanding of where can you represent a flow by a potential flow that ultimately leads to the uh, most coherent understanding of the value of potential flow and what real fluids do. So in that direction, in the next chapter and in the next recording, I'm going to discuss boundary layer theory, which will take us one step closer to understanding why is the flow not a potential flow everywhere. All right. So I will see you in the next video or in the next live session.